Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome um, to everyone from wherever you're uh, calling in from. Um, my name is uh, Jonathan Ray, and it gives me great pleasure as Chelsea Green's UK commissioning editor to introduce the, the discussion on hashtag future gen lessons from a small country between the author Jane Davison and Satish Kumar and chaired by Oliver Blatt. I first met Jane in 2015, at the year the Act came into law. It's the first law in the world to explicitly legislate for future generations and couples mental and physical health um, with planetary health. The Act, if you want, is a manifestation of the Welsh people reflecting back on themselves what is truly important to them. It is a vital act in the real meaning of that word that it belongs to life and it took the vitality of Jane and her colleagues from across Wales to bring it into life as a beacon of real hope with sleeves rolled up. This book shares that story as an inspiration to others who are putting the abundance and diversity of life and future generations at the heart of all that we do as communities and societies. So I'm very much looking forward to this discussion. I'm so pleased that you're able to join us. Um, this is being recorded and it will be available afterwards on YouTube uh, via the Chelsea Green uh, TV channel. Um, I would like to just take a moment just to make a toast uh, to Jane uh, for her extraordinary work and a beautifully written book um, and for the collaboration that you brought about uh, to bring about this extraordinary act uh, that is transforming Wales as we speak. <coughs> so I'd love to just raise a toast to you, Jane, uh, and congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I'll hand over to Oliver, who will just go through the uh, uh, routine for the, uh, for the webinar. Hi, thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today. We've been looking forward to seeing this book come into the world uh, for, for many months. It's, uh, it's a great read. It's also, I think, a super important book, a super timely book, and we're going to be discussing what's in those pages. We're not going to give you too much away because we want you to go away and buy it, uh, but we'll give you a flavour over the next 40 minutes or so. Please do put your questions on the screen. We're keen for this to be as interactive as possible. So, so flag those up. We, we put some time aside at the end, uh, but uh, as they come in, I'll, I'll, I'll clock them <coughs> to our two panelists. Um, so our panelists, Jane. Uh, Jane Davison, Pro Vice Chancellor Emeritus at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David's. That's a long old uh, title there. I'd like to see your business card. Uh, but you wear so many other different hats as well as, uh, as author. You've been a, a teacher in your time, a, a social worker, but I'm never sure that it was just because that's your instinct or whether you're actually employed as a social worker. But um, a politician uh, for a decade and more. You got all the juicy jobs when the assembly kicked in, uh, Minister of Education to begin with and then Minister of uh, Environment, Sustainability and Housing. Tell me, did you enjoy, did, did housing sort of get left off a bit at the end there? <laughs> was, it, was it environment, sustainability, oh, I'll do some housing on Friday afternoon? No, it wasn't like that at all, Oliver. Um, I think the, um, my, although my title was Environment, Sustainability and, and Housing, um, when I was given that title, we were in coalition with Plaid Cymru, um, now it was a Labour uh, Party minister. We were in coalition with Plaid Cymru and it was my colleague for, from Plaid Cymru that led on housing and we worked very closely together. So my real focus of my job was on environment and sustainability. But it was um, it was interesting job because it included climate change, it included planning, it included energy and buildings, um, it included nature, uh, it included the national parks. Um, and uh, as such, it was a portfolio that was carried out, I think, by seven ministers in the UK government. <laughs> so, uh -huh. So well, I think a small country has to adapt. <laughs> Indeed. I should have said you, you introduced the, 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 the levy on plastic bags. You've got the coastal walk in Wales going. Uh, you made Wales a recycling. So I suspected they'd given you tourism. You would have found some way of working in the environment into, into your brief. Well, I, yes, I but, think uh, if they'd given tourism, I'd have got the coastal path done even quicker. <laughs> <laughs> 
Before we jump into Satish, tell, tell us where you are, Jane. Uh, we, we've designed this, you'll see, as a fireside chat. I've, to, to yep. not take the luminosity from our two panellists, I've chosen a very uh, white background. So, Jane, where are you? Where's your fireside? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm in my home, um, which is a refurbished barn in the village of St. Dogmalls. Um, we have 10 acres of land, um, uh, six acres of which is woodland. We try and grow all our own food. And over the 10 years that we've been here, um, we've refurbished the barn completely so that it's fully insulated. And we run our heating and our hot water uh, from the sun and from the ground. So we have tried to be as sustainable as possible in, in everything that we do. Oh, that's terrific. And you were born in Zimbabwe, aren't you? Do you consider yourself a, an adopted Welsh woman? What's your connection with Wales? Well, it's, it, I'm, I am an adopted Welsh woman because I didn't come to live here um, until my late teens. Um, I was actually born in Birmingham, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, which is still firmly in the West Midlands. But I was very young uh, when we first moved to uh, what is now Zimbabwe because my father um, was a, a key person who opened the, uh, the medical college there. Um, and he was, it was very important to him that, um, that the medical school was going to be a multiracial medical school um, serving uh, the whole of Africa. And so I grew up, in fact, with two doctor parents, absolutely immersed in nature um, throughout the whole of my childhood and living in a country where a lot of our schooling was outdoors and where I used to spend an awful lot of time out there on my bicycle. And I think, I think there's two very important elements from that. It's the, the service element from my parents and also nature. Um, and, and at the time, Zimbabwe was one of three countries in the world that were seen as the breadbasket of the world. And when we think of the difficulties that the country faces now, we can, we can see what changes happen, both politically as well as in the context of climate. So I think there are some really important messages in that about how one has to look after future generations. Terrific. Well, there's lots more to discuss. Let's just uh, introduce Satish. Hi there, Satish. Hello. <laughs> Satish Kumar, activist and editor, um, director of programs at Schumacher College, that epicenter of ecological scholarship, um, magazine editor uh, of, of Resurgence magazine. You've been a Jane Monk, I gather. That's a, that's a long cry from Birmingham, that's for sure. Uh, nuclear <laughs> disarmament activist, all round reverer and lover of nature. It's great that you could join us today. Tell us, where, where are you, um, Satish? Where's your fireside? Yes, um, I am in North Devon, a small village called Heartland spelled H-A-R-T, which means deer. So it's the land of deer. And, uh, and uh, it's very near the sea, the Atlantic. And we have here resurgence center. Um, so this uh, center where I'm speaking here now from. And uh, so we organize various events here. And this is the home of resurgence and the ecologist magazine and the ecologist website. And uh, in Heartland, where Jane came, and, and Jane and I spent about a week together, interview, Jane interviewing me. Uh, so this was a, a beautiful place for us to, uh, to communicate and talk. I have lived here in this village for 40 years. Um, tell us about that, that first encounter. Um, it certainly impacted Jane. I, I know she references in the book, this, this sort of insight to ecology and economy. Do, do you remember that, Satish, or are you just throwing pearls of wisdom out? And, no, uh, I do remember that. I mean, of course, I had heard of Jane's uh, reputation um, as a very leading, radical, environmental politician um, and uh, creating new ideas, sustainability and future generations and nobody else was taking interest in those ideas as much as Jane. So I had a lot of uh, reputation, uh, but then there was an event uh, in, um, uh, in Wales, uh, Emergence, and there we met, and I was amazed and impressed and inspired, and the very first day became a great admirer of her visionary 
ideas and her work and, and her uh, radical thinking. And then somehow the idea emerged that Jane uh, and I uh, talked together and we create a, a, a DVD based on my books. And so Jane came to Heartland and spent a week here and interviewed me. So, so our relationship became uh, even much closer, more intimate, more strong. And then uh, Jane kindly honored me through her university and gave me an honorary doctorate of science. And I was just saying that I am a man of spirit more than science. Um, and uh, the University of Wales in, uh, in, um, in Lampeter is a kind of center for theological studies. So a theological university giving honorary doctorate to a theological man and a de degree of science. So bringing science and spirituality together, because most people think that science and spirituality don't go together. They are two worlds apart, where uh, Jane and I say that science should be guided by spirit and spirit should be informed by science. And they are two sides of the same coin. And that was a great honor for me to receive that honorary degree. Uh, it was inspired and, 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 uh, and managed and, and initiated by Jane. So we became very good friends over the years. Terrific. Well, science, uh, spirituality, Let, we'll throw politics into the, into the mix as well, because uh, yeah. that's obviously the context of, of the Future Generations Act, which the book's all about. Before we talk about the act, and it would be good for, for some people, I'm, I'm sure, will be expert on it. Some of you might have even had to sort of filling spreadsheets related to it or something painful like that. But um, uh, let's, let's just cap, so we're clear on the, on the, uh, on the concept, the future generations. What do you understand? Because it's a trope that any, any politician that stands on a podium says, oh, we've got to think about the future generations. What, what do you understand by the term? And why do you think it's, it's, why is it such a powerful term for you? Well, I think, um, I think we have to go back to um, the creation of the National Assembly and the Government of Wales Act in 1998, which actually contained within it a duty to promote sustainable development in everything the new Assembly did. And um, since I was in the executive of the new Assembly and then in government, um, from the uh, second year of the Assembly's existence, it actually became clear that this was really hard. You know, what did this mean? What was a generation? What was sustainable development? So you had to unpick all the language of, of that short sentence in terms of looking at what actions um, you might take to deliver it. And, and the, the most common definition of sustainable development um, is the Brundtland um, uh, definition, which is about not compromising um, future generations' ability to meet their own needs. So that was adopted really quickly. And I really liked that because I felt, well, that means you're, at the very least, you're doing no harm. Um, but at the most, you'd be doing things to benefit future generations. And I felt acutely aware, as somebody who is a, you know, the, the, the generation after the Second World War, that I was the recipient of a generation that did think like that. They were actively trying to create a better future for future generations. They introduced the welfare state. They looked after the vulnerable. Um, they wanted people to have housing. They wanted people to have full employment. Uh, they wanted to tackle poverty. They introduced the NHS. The Education Act came in so that people had opportunities of education. All these things were about a generation who never wanted anybody to go through what they'd been through. And they wanted to offer hope and opportunity. So for me, it was always about how do you offer hope and opportunity to people who have no vote, who might not yet be born, um, and have no say in how decisions are made. And throughout my adult life, what I've seen is more and more politics has become short term and more and more decisions are made within the timetable of an election. And actually sometimes, I mean, just in the last few days, we've had decisions made one day that are overturned the next. You know, so nobody is looking after the interests of the future. 
And when you now start taking statistical evidence about it, bringing together you know, Satish's point about sort of science and spirit, you're finding that younger people now, those who are 30 and under, they are poorer than my generation. They are less secure in their jobs. They're less secure in their homes. Um, they will probably have large university debts. And that's before we factor in either the outcome of this awful pandemic or climate change. And so we're not, it's not just that we're not thinking about them, we're actively making their futures worse. So I became an absolute champion of the fact that Wales was the only country in the UK that got given this duty to promote sustainable development. And it became clear to me very early on that a duty to promote was not enough. And then when I was given the responsibility, uh, when, as you described in the um, beginning of this interview, as Minister for Environment, Sustainability and Housing, and asked to therefore lead this agenda for the Welsh Government, I realised that if we didn't have something stronger than a duty to promote, it could never be delivered. And that even if we had the ambition in Wales, even when we had all the cabinet in support, even when senior civil servants said they were in support, if we couldn't do it with all that in play, then actually we were going to need legislation that we agreed as our values framework to help us carry on doing something that was completely countercultural. Yeah. And I think that's then, the fundamental point, yeah. is with the social term, we're always countercultural. So then, uh, you, uh, when we met first time, you talked, we, we talked about the relationship between ecology and economy. We did. At the moment, our world is very much focused on the economy. And economy in terms of human welfare. Whereas you are talking about economy and ecology as we talked about, so that human-centered thinking, that everything, nature is there for humans, and the economy, uh, nature is there as a resource for the economy. And so we exploit nature, and the humans are somehow superior, and all other species, all other, I mean, forests and rivers and, and, and animals and everything else is in the service of human beings. And therefore, we have somehow right to exploit and, and even harm uh, just for our benefit. So this is what you are in a way challenging, that future generations, uh, we need to protect and conserve and, and preserve our natural wealth. And nature is not only a resource for the economy, Nature is a source of life. Can you say a little bit about that, the economy and ecology? Yeah, no, th thank you, Satish. I mean, in fact, I think it was one of those most memorable moments that, that uh, when, when I first met you and I hadn't realised how silver-tongued you were, <laughs> that, that um, because you, you really think about the words you use and their relationship, and I'm an English teacher by profession, and yet... Um, the words economy and ecology had always felt to me like just two words in the, in, in the English lexicon. But of course, they're not in the English lexicon at all. They both draw their, their derivation from oikos, um, the Greek for the planet home. And I remember you just telling this wonderful, wicked story while I was sitting um, at your feet, as so many have done in, in Schumacher College and in your fireside chats, which we're quite trying to replicate virtually here with me by my fireside and you by yours, is, is that um, we think only about the economy and we forget about ecology, but actually oikos, the planet home, eco, ology, the knowledge of, so ecology is the knowledge of our planet home. And economy, onomy, the management. Economy is the management of our planet home. And you looked at us all wickedly and said, how can you manage what you do not know? And I just thought it was like one of those moments, which is why I wanted to do the launch with you. I was one of those moments when it all made sense. And I was thinking, I've been arguing for years, I mean, ever since 1992 and um, the Earth Summit, and they talked about humans, the first principle being humans living in harmony with nature. 
not putting nature to service, but put, living in harmony with nature. And I thought that's absolutely right. We should all be ecologists. Definitely, we should all be ecologists before economists, because how can we be economists about a planet that we don't know nothing about? And that is so important. And one of the, um, the themes that is really strong in my book is the fact that we have not achieved anywhere in the world biodiversity targets that have been set by the UN. And that for us as humans, we cannot live, we cannot survive unless we have clean air, clean water, unless we have nature working with us. And without those things, there will be no economy. So it is an ecology first approach that I then tried to take in everything I did yeah. following that conversation. And I think what is important to, uh, as well in this is that for me, it could be just that those few moments of a conversation and something I'd never really thought about became clear. And I hope that what we can do through this book is in few moments of conversation or people reading this book and the 140 people who've contributed to this book um, can actually understand and maybe find a way that gives them their individual epiphanies. Because we have to live in harmony with nature. We only have one planet. And the other phrase of yours that I love is that relationship between soil, soul and society. Because without the relationship with soil, then the others don't follow. So it's about making sure that we, that we recognize the bigger picture of all of this, isn't it? That's right, that's right. And, and Wales obviously has been lauded around the world for this, this piece of legislation that, that, that puts this more balanced, long-termist approach um, uh, onto the statute books and, 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 and causes um, uh, policy makers to, uh, what's your term uh, to have, uh, the, the um, license to think uh, differently, or, or where's that effect? Permission to think differently. Permission to think differently. But it's not a new, it's a not a new concept, is it? I mean, in a way, we've lost our way. Isn't that right, Satish? I mean, the, these, the, this, this more balanced approach, the, the soil and the soul, is, 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 a, is, is something that we've seen in cultures throughout history. Yes, absolutely. And uh, if you take the indigenous cultures, uh, from the uh, United States, North America, South America, Aboriginal people, uh, all over the world. The indigenous cultures have always thought of future generations and a soil, uh, earth, land, uh, earth is our mother, uh, that kind of understanding. And the indigenous cultures always thought of seventh generation. How our actions today are going to impact the seventh generation not only our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, but great, great, great seven generations. So that is the kind of idea of a harmony with nature and respecting nature and seeing that we are nature. At the moment, our Western economic thinking and scientific thinking has separated humans and nature. Nature out there the trees and the animals and the birds and the mountains and the rivers and the oceans, and we humans separate, and therefore we control nature. So our challenge is, and our job is to conquer nature. Whereas our indigenous culture said that we are nature. We are made of earth, air, fire, water. We come from the soil. We go back to the soil. We are made of soil. Our food is made of soil. Our wood is made of soil from which we make, build houses. So this unity, rather than separation, is the key to indigenous cultures. And, uh, and if we can, and I think this book is a pioneering book. Um, uh, Jane has given this book, which is unique. I don't think there's any book that I have come across which talks about seventh generation or the future generations and how we take care of uh, our planet in such a way that our economy and our, our society and our systems can last for millions of years to come. So I think it's a wonderful pioneering book and I hope everybody reads it. Thank you, Satish. Um, do keep uh, posting, guys. It's great. We've got people from Longbridge, Deverell. We've got someone from Crosswell. We've got someone from, uh, someone called Herbie. Um, 
and uh, from Wrexham. So we've got a, a, a Welsh resident there. Uh, given the, uh, the, the, the longevity of this concept, it seems remarkable that it took till 2015 for actually uh, legislators to write it down on paper, oblige policymakers to, to, to feed this into their thinking. Jane, I, I'm really keen to talk about the difference that the act has made. But before we jump into that question, just give us some context. How did it come about? What was your role in, in bringing this act? And, and, and actually, what, what's the app do in a nutshell? <laughs> um, I, think, I think what's really interesting um, is when you say that it's taken such a long time for policymakers to think about this, what is in one sense terrifying is Wales is still the only, the only country in the world that has taken the step to protect current and future generations in law. And the only country in the world to actually put the Brundtland definition into law, despite the, the Brundtland definition being the most popular definition of sustainable development and used many, many millions of times um, since the Our Common Futures Commission back in 1987. And I think for me, this is about that dislocation between um, what people want to do and then what they are able to do. And I absolutely take my hat off, not just to the Welsh Government, but to the Assembly members who voted for this as a way of almost holding their own feet to the fire. And of course, it's a fire we don't want them to ever meet. But the climate change features under three of the main goals of the Act. The Act is, in, in short, the Act is... Um, four domains. Um, uh, people interested in the sustainability argument will be aware that people are always talking about um, uh, environment, economy and society as a three-legged stool, perhaps. And the Act adds culture to that, a hugely important addition, which makes it more in the Welsh context, and I said the chair of an Act, um, something that can actually root all the decisions reflecting culture, values, bilingual nature of Wales, uh, and also its multiculturalism. It has seven goals, they're all interconnected, but they include health, uh, equality, resilience, uh, economy defined in the context of, of prosperity, um, culture and, va and values, cohesive communities, and Wales's impact upon the world. And what is really exciting to me is that because in the 10 years that the National Assembly for Wales had the duty to promote sustainable development but not deliver it, it never ever failed in that duty as far as the Audit Office was concerned. What became the clarion call from all those who were critiquing the performance against the Act was that there needed to be a proper process for the government and public services to deliver it. And uniquely, that process is in the Act. And that process is called Five Ways of Working. So the government and its public services are required to think long term. They're required to be preventative. They're pre required to collaborate with, the, with, with each other. They're required to integrate their thinking uh, about the goals so that we stop any silo um, type approaches. And they're required to involve people about whom they make decisions. Now, for, this is the heart of it for me. This is about good decision making tied to the right kind of outcomes. So when you've got a process and you've got content, the opportunity to absolutely change what government does with its people, not for its people or to its people, but with its people is there. I think it would be fair to say in the context of the Welsh government, because undoubtedly there'll be people who say, it's not done a lot yet, um, is that Welsh, the Welsh Government has only had primary powers since 2011. So this Act was, uh, was made in that first administration when the Welsh Government had primary powers. And if you just look at some of the laws that the Welsh Government has passed recently, if you look at the fact that only this week 16 and 17 year olds are going to be allowed to vote, um, an important uh, opportunity for younger people to participate um, in, in, uh, in, in, the, in their voting for representation. There is a, a new Young People's Assembly 
um, therefore, that is able to, and which actually shadows the portfolios of Welsh ministers. If we think about the anti-smacking legislation that came in um, uh, 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 only a few months ago, um, and then if we also think of the organ, the presumption in terms of um, uh, presumed consent in organ donation. I mean, when these are done individually, they are just part of a narrative about a country in the same way as you described my legislation on recycling that's brought Wales um, up with the best in the world or carrier bags or the coast path. But when you start seeing all these together and when you start seeing a planning act that puts well-being of future generations at its heart, when you see an environment act which is seen to be one of the most ambitious in the world, when you see a decision on a new motorway turned down on environmental grounds and when you see that the current budget uh, in front of the Assembly for Consideration is deemed to be a well-being budget, you start to see that the Act is actually influencing all aspects of public policy in Wales. It needs to go a lot further, but there are messages about the learning from what had to be done in terms of taking such an approach into law and keeping politicians engaged in it, not just in one administration, but beyond one administration, beyond two administrations, beyond many administrations. That is what will secure the future for future generations. Brilliant. I'm looking at these, uh, these uh, contributions. Thanks, guys. It's great to know so many people are online. Oh, we've got a lot. Professor, we've got a professor. I'm going to have to read that slowly. But Billy's in a field. Um, he's listening in from uh, Aberreron. Um, what's the most, you referenced some of the ways that things have been changing. What, what, what example has most inspired you, has, has made you think, has tickled, tickled you pink? Well, the, I, think, I think the example that has most inspired me, um, you need to read the book to, uh, to see in full. But I just want to put a shout out to the work that's going on on an initiative called Skyline. And um, Skyline is a, an incredibly exciting project. It's, it's in three South Wales valleys, valleys where the communities were built to, to extract coal from the ground. And all through my political life, people have wanted to support the valleys in new regeneration opportunities. And I think it's fair to say that despite many millions of pounds, huge amounts of government investment and huge amounts of government goodwill, it has not happened. And those communities feel very left behind. And Skyline is an incredibly imaginative project which takes three valleys and says, what if? those valleys were given ownership of the land around them, were given the means by which to define what, what they wanted their community to be, what kind of jobs they wanted to have, what kind of businesses they wanted to create, what could happen. Now, the idea that that is absolutely framing, framed under the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. It's still in early days, but I think it will be utterly transformative. And I know that there's huge support both within those communities, within the local councils and within the government uh, for doing this. And it's a brave decision because this is not about saying you can have 10 years to practice. This is about handing over land in perpetuity. Mm. And I think it's that kind of brave decision which we would not have seen without the legislation. That's a, that's, it's a great example and, uh, and, and you write it very well in, in the book. Um, Andy's got a question. He's in Teddington and it happens to be my next question. So I'm going to read that one out. And that's about the exciting things that are happening uh, outside Wales. Obviously, lots of interest. You say that no one else has got it onto the statute book as yet. But um, tell us what's happening in the, the UK, what uh, Lord John Bird is doing in, in Westminster. Well, this is, I mean, I'm actually in the big issue today um, yeah. talking about, uh, about this. But um, I didn't know Lord John Bird, other than the fact that he'd created the big issue um, and had never met him. Uh, I knew that he liked to get his own way and I knew he was incredibly strong on social pro projects and that he was never wanted a project that couldn't deliver. And so when I found out that he was um, actually um, determined to pick up the Welsh Act and translate it into a UK context, uh, I was absolutely delighted. And he's been working with Sophie Howe, the Future Generations Commissioner in Wales, in doing that. 
And now that he has a private members bill, this is a, an arcane procedure in the, in the uh, Houses of Parliament, but he has a, um, a private men members bill that has been taken forward to the extent now it's up to whether government uh, will give it some time so it can properly be debated. Uh, John's leading it in the Lords, Caroline Lucas is leading it in the Commons. And there is an all party parliamentary group, that is the MPs who want to be involved in taking this agenda forward, of all parties, quite large numbers of MPs, including one Boris Johnson, signed up, signed up uh, before the last election to tell John they would support what he was doing in terms of taking a future generations piece of legislation forward. So we, 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 we wait to see. Wow, that's amazing. There's a, there's a man of his word. Um, you mentioned the commissioner, Sophie Howe. Just, just clarify, what, what's, what's that role? What does she do? Uh, how, uh, how does, tell us a bit about the mechanics of how this act is actually spreading through government. Okay, well, the act, the act first of all, is, is an act for the government and all its public services. But my learning through the time I had as minister made me realize that there were four things that needed to be in place. And I'm glad that they all have survived the parliamentary procedures um, uh, uh, moving forward to the act becoming law. The first one was that the government itself had to be accountable for its behavior because too often governments will make laws about others which don't apply to themselves. So it was critically important to me that the government was accountable itself. Secondly, there had to be an external independent um, uh, commissioner um, uh, in terms of ensuring both that they could hold the government and the public services to account, but also that they could be a critical friend. And Wales pioneered commissioners, the first children's commissioner was in Wales, and that's now been, for example, adopted across the whole of the UK. And that model does mean the commissioner has some powers, she would argue, I'm sure, not enough, um, but some powers in terms of, in, of, of ensuring that people are required to publicly respond to, to, what, to, to um, the kind of where they've fallen short on their uh, commitments. There's also the Wales Audit Office. All the public services are audited by the Audit Office, so it would have been completely wrong to set up a different audit mechanism. What I wanted was the reverse. I wanted the Wales Audit Office to put sustainability at the heart of its audit process for everyone. Um, and therefore that work is ongoing, but the Auditor, the Auditor General has a significant function and now has designated staff who are required to deliver on this and work very closely uh, with, the, with the Commissioner. And then finally, um, if there is dissatisfaction at all those previous levels, there's the opportunity to, to take judicial review because this is legislation and those goals and the ways of working are written into law. So there are some substantial elements within the Act and it will take some time before we know whether they're enough um, in the sense that there will need to be cases taken there will, in order to establish precedents as to whether the Act needs to be stronger or whether the sister legislation such as the Environment Act which is the compliance vehicle needs to be stronger. But yeah. the Act, because it's an Act, the it has a compliance element within it but the compliance really sits in other pieces of legislation. The purpose of the act as I foresaw it was the idea that it creates the values framework. It holds people to account for making sure they take all the right um, uh, aspects into account on their decision making. And it's not for me to determine what the right aspects were. That is where parliamentary democracy comes in. And that's why it was the assembly members, now the Senate members, who were the ones who determined what were the aspects that needed to be taken into account in the interests of future generations. You mentioned the assembly members. If, if we did a sort of straw poll, how many, how many do you think would, would on a sort of one to 10 of, of just ignore it and 10 absolutely passionate. This is, you know, this is what gets them out of bed on Monday morning, the Future Generations Act. Oh, so where does it fit, do you, do you feel? Um, I, I honestly, I couldn't answer that question in the sense that I am, I've been out of politics a decade. <laughs> and so, um, it's not my style to sort of peer back in my previous window, as it were. But what I can say is that, um, 
the ministers are all using it. And I can say that there is a, that all the committees are using it and they're all growing to a greater understanding of their opportunity to be brave. And I think if we think about it as permission to think differently, it's actually permission, it's permission to think positively. It's a permission to factor in future generations into your decision making so that you are making life better for people. And we all go into politics to make life better. So I think there's, there's a lot written. There's, a, a, there's lots of people who feel that the act is not enough because it doesn't have every compliance mechanism within it. There are people who think it should be the whole act, as it were. But I think that we need to both give it a chance. But fundamentally, it needs brave leadership. It needs to become a people's act. There, needs to be a, there was a, a lot of people involved in its making. There was a massive exercise in Wales called The Wales We Want before the act was made with thousands of people involved. The government should have enough confidence to go back out now to people in terms of re-looking at a Wales we want with an act that can deliver on it. And in doing so, it will also create a rod for its own back, but it's the right rod, it's the democratic rod where people can hold their le legislature to account because it needs to be able to deliver a hope for the future. Brilliant, uh, I'm conscious. Uh, uh, Oliver. Satish, uh, yes, jump in. Most, um, Parliament members, MPs and Assembly members, intellectually and conceptually understand that the environment is important, sustainability is important, but we are all caught in this money machine. Mm -hmm. And we, I mean, most members of Parliament and Assemblies um, in Scotland, Wales, uh, uh, central government in, in UK, uh, and in other countries as well, the same story. So what we need to free ourselves from is the, the meaning of economy, as we talked about in the, in the beginning, is much bigger. And, and it is not just about management of money. It's a money nomi, uh, which is um, kind of dominating our thinking and not economy. So if we can free ourselves from this idea that somehow we have to run this money, money machine and money nomi, and then we can think about well-being as a central point. I think the, I, in the context of climate change and global warming and all the movement going on, intellectually people get it, but practically they don't find it easy to move forward. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, um, Satish. Uh, yeah. And I think the that one of the critical elements for the moment is that with this COVID pandemic, yeah. people are reevaluating what is important. Yeah. And nature has been hugely important to people in this context. And just as now we're valuing those people who have, who have kept our lives on track, who've looked after us, um, who have delivered things to our door, who have carried on producing food, you know, all those people, often people on very low incomes, we now recognize they're the people that underpin our society, not yeah. necessarily those hedge fund managers that apparently we want to keep. Exactly. And it's, so there's a real chance, I think, for a reset post COVID. Yes. And one of my, my key messages in my book is that we've got to fund nature conservation so Absolutely. much better than we do at the moment. We've got to put that at the heart yeah. of what we do about our natural yeah. environment. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, we could carry on all day, but we're going to have, I'm going to sort of shift across to the side of the screen where I've got all the, all, all the questions coming in. There was a, a comment from EJ Goodfellow. Thanks for that, EJ. He says that if you're basically in the Welsh Assembly and you don't know about the Act, you shouldn't, shouldn't be there. Um, but let's pick up on this, this one, just this come in from, from Pauline. Um, and it, it, it's uh, with reference to sort of the post-COVID build back, um, uh, situation we're facing. Do you, do you think there's an appetite, a greater appetite now, or, or opportunity, should we say, to pursue this this kind of thinking, given the economic trials and tribulations that uh, that, that we're facing now and in, 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 into the short and medium term? Yeah, yes, I do. And, and I think what's really, I mean, if you just take energy, for example, um, 
you know, we, we know that, for example, I mean, BP started exploration um, in 2018 off the north coast of Scotland. Uh, and what they're doing there at Clare, Clare Ridge is going to bring um, many, uh, well, I think it's, it's 200, uh, it's a quarter of a billion additional tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions into the frame. Now, when we know that we need to be at zero carbon emissions by 2050, when people like me are arguing that we should get to those by 2030, when Professor Kevin Anderson, who used to advise the Climate Change Commission I set up, um, put out a paper only yesterday saying that um, we actually need to be reducing our emissions by 10% every year in the UK from this year, and we know that although they've come down a little bit in COVID, of course, it's been a very short time and they're still actually going up. But these big decisions lock in carbon emissions for 30, 60, 100 years. And therefore, there should be no decisions at the moment that are locking in increased carbon emissions. So if we don't factor future generations into what we do, we carry on making these decisions which actually are directly contradictory to the thinking that we need for future generations so and i think what's happened post covid is that people are starting to think well if we're going to build back better which is one of the hashtags then what do we most need to do and for me it's a very simple message it's a simple message about we have to keep the fossil fuels in the ground. We have to get to zero by 2035 just to keep in line with our Paris Agreement. And we have to absolutely focus on nature conservation. And I think what's interesting about my book is that with 140 voices and the learning that we've achieved in, in Wales and the messages to other countries, it's the learning which is attractive to other countries because everybody has struggled with how, if they've started trying to do this, everybody struggled with how to do it. And I'm hoping that the learning from Wales actually does by giving content and process and values, all in a values framework, that I can look my grandson in the eye and say, I'm doing everything I can to protect you from the kind of future that if people like me aren't around, you will have to experience. Yeah. And in addition to, um, to um, energy, we also need to look at the food production, yeah. Jane. And we, at the moment, nearly 30% of carbon emission and greenhouse gases are created by agriculture. And our agriculture is very energy intensive. And therefore, we need to go back to more uh, ecological agroecology or more uh, some kind of ecological system uh, embedded in our agriculture. So food production, food processing, food distribution, all that has to be part of this energy system because we are uh, at the moment so centralized, so few people working in producing food and more and more energy is used to produce food. I think we need to have more people working and those who want to work uh, on the land, they should be respected and there should be greater dignity to working on the land. At the moment, we don't value our farmers. We don't value, we don't pay them properly. Uh, bankers can get a lot of money, but farmers don't. So yeah. we need to look at the food production and, and food production should be more environmentally sustainable and, and less energy intensive and less carbon emission. You're um, absolutely right. I mean, I think the that the, the, there's a great little story, Satish, here in St. Dogmals, because we have, a, we have a local mill and a miller. And um, uh, she's been producing amazing flour and she was trying to get it in, into all the shops locally. And they all had contracts with other providers. And then along comes the COVID pandemic and it turns out the other providers can't get their flour to the shops in Cardigan. So her flour, it's now <laughs> has saved yeah. the day. So yeah, where, yeah. You know, where, when absence of flour has been a real problem across the UK, because we've had a miller, we've, we've got excellent local flour. But that regenerative food system is absolutely at the heart of this because energy and food 
um, go hand in hand in the context of the physiological needs of humans. And we need to get back to what we might call the baseline of Maslow's hierarchy of need, where we actually make sure that humans have the essentials to survive. And we've forgotten about that. Yeah. And the, Wales only grows 3% of its fruit and vegetables at the moment. So massive opportunities to, for Wales to be more resilient and to lead the way as well in agri-ecological food. And the Food and Farming Commission is trying to get us all to do that. And I'm utterly behind them. Yeah, thank you. I'm conscious time is ticking on. You mentioned the hashtag um, Build Back Better. This one, use it guys, future gen, when you're on social media telling your friends, we'd like to, we'd love to see it out there, it's so important. Um, now I'm gonna put you on the clock, Jane, okay? Because lots of questions are coming in, we haven't got much time. Um, there's, there's, oh, I should say we need to add uh, clothing, please, to that list of, of, of food, food and clothing, to similar sort of uh, 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 origin for, 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 for that thinking around regenerative land use. Um, there's a question uh, from Roz, uh, who's a bit skeptical, I sense. Uh, oh, it's fine. Okay, Wales, tiny country. Uh, you can experiment. Uh, but realistically, could an India, could a China, could a, could a USA, could they, could realistically a large economy with, with millions of mouths to feed and millions of factory workers, could it realistically adopt this kind of legislation? 60 okay. seconds. A, a really interesting question, Roz. I think that small countries are really good to be experimenters. And I think what we've seen across the world, for example, with the Climate Cities Initiative, is that 40 big cities across the world are working together to actually take solutions in their own country, learning from each other. And it's the learning that counts. Brilliant. Um, VJ from Germany. He's he's uh, he's very passionate about circular economy, and, and would like to know if there's anything exciting going on in Wales on, on that agenda. Uh, yes, there is. We 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 actually have a number of um, uh, organisations in Wales dedicated to the circular economy. What we did around recycling. Um, is predicated much more now on reuse, which is really important. And also, we're actually, um, I understand, likely to have a complementary currency introduced here to actually create more opportunities in a local foundational economy. Circular economy is very much at the heart of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act because it is about low carbon prosperity that brings benefit locally and designs out waste. And we've had a zero waste uh, agenda right from the beginning of the National Assembly. This question from Professor Claire Taylor. Um, uh, it comes back to your, one of your original points about the importance of culture. And she's asking, um, uh, how can we further convince policymakers and funders at local, regional, national level uh, to support the arts, um, that the arts support social transformation that have a role beyond just the elite going to the opera that you know there is a a, a base of function there for that for, for the arts well i'm i actually um i was an english and drama teacher and i actually another bit that you didn't know about oliver i spent a short time as a as a professional actor as well so i actually i'm passionate about the arts and i i actually think the arts are absolutely essential in the context of regeneration because it gives people the opportunity, whether it's through the medium of paint, whether it's through the medium of acting, whether it's through the medium of song, to engage with each other and experience different kinds of opportunity. So for Wales, it was really important that culture in its broader sense, culture, heritage, language, the arts, is a critical part of this. And I think that's actually something people really get in Wales. Wales has the largest um, youth Arts Festival with the, with the Eirvai Sedford and the largest celebration of its national culture with the National Sedford in Europe. So a small country can have the largest uh, celebration of its own culture and values and that gives us a great start. And I guess the months ahead are a real test case for that, right? I mean, money budgets are being decided uh, when you're looking at employment programmes or theatres and, and painting workshops. It's a brave politician that's going to pick the second over the first, isn't it? I do hope so. I do. I mean, I just think that this is, you know, in, 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 in essence, the, 
As we move forward from one administration to another in Wales, um, this will be the biggest test of the Act, because obviously, you know, in a sense, um, Labour has been in power in Wales uh, in one form or other in, in all the administrations uh, since the Assembly um, has, been, has been in place. And the recommendations of the Future Generations Commissioner, which came out um, a couple of weeks ago, a year before the Assembly election, are really important because all parties can take some of those and adapt them in their own party settings. And that point about culture can then transfer to any political party or any other country, because it is about the culture and values of the organisation, which is shows where, where they will take um, uh, future plans from this. But the Act means that all the plans will still be geared to improve the lives of future generations. Um, time is ticking away. Let, let's come back specifically to the book. Did, uh, what was the, and, and literally we've only got a few minutes to tell, what was the process of writing? Was it, was it fun? You've mentioned these 140 people you collaborated with. Um, they're people that must be really inspiring process to have gone through and quite a difficult editing process as well, I would have thought. Well, I, 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 I don't know, and I hope my editor is, is on this call, but I want to do the biggest shout out in the world to Moona Rail, because she was the most amazing editor. I gave her nearly 100,000 words, because I had 140 contributions, most of which were 200 words long, so it was some 30,000 words. And she has uh, worked with me to actually turn all my ramblings and research into a book. So I think the, bo the book is as much Moona's as mine. But um, a good editor is absolutely critical. But I think it sums up... Yes, is that over to Moona? <laughs> yeah, well, you're too modest. And you, and you say you don't, like, you, you don't like being called the author of the act or the, or the creator of the act. Um, is this just a commitment? Is this, is, this, is this false modesty or is this a genuine no, no, commitment no. To, to being collaborative? And, and no, it's absolutely awesome. real because I, I'd left four years before the Act. What I left was the framework that I outlined earlier, uh, which survived all the discussions into the Act. So I, I, I'm, I've always accepted that phrases like the architect, because that was of the structure um, so I'm, I'm, I, I'm happy to accept responsibility for the structure of the Act. What has delighted me beyond measure is the fact that the Act, when it came out, was even better than I could have envisaged. And I do think it's an incredible piece of legislation. And I think Wales, the people of Wales, should be very, very proud they have it. And I think now they should feel that they can use it to hold their government and public services to account. And the more that the book gets publicised, the more opportunities there are for people to go knocking on the doors of those public services and the government uh, to call for initiatives that actually deliver on the principles of the Act. Brilliant. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's a sp off, off, off screen, Jane, there's a big spat. I've obviously, I've offended Ros by saying she's sceptical about the act. She's not at all. She thinks it's wonderful. She thinks Wales is small, but punches above its weight. My apologies, Ros. So um, the book is now out. You can get it in all bookshops, I'm presuming, and online places. Support your independent bookshops if you can, especially in Wales. What's your, let's finish here, what's your real aspiration for this book. Congratulations on doing it. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a big task to put something like this together. Not quite as big as actually making the act happen in the first place, perhaps, but you know, congratulations. But now it's out in the world, what's your hope for it? Well, I, I think when I started, I thought that because of the kind of person I was and the jobs I'd had, I'd, I'd be really writing, I'd be writing for the policy professionals, I'd be writing for parliamentarians. The more I've done it, and the more that the voices from others, including your own, Oliver, have come in, I see this immense appetite for a different way of doing things. So I hope that this is picked up by campaigners and activists the world over to make demands of their government to look after the interests of future generations. And it won't look like Wales, and we may never know that it came from this. But if we saw more countries looking after the interests of future generations, I'll be quietly happy that the book has had a mark. I had one job from Jonathan at uh, Chelsea Green Publishing, it was to finish on time. Satish, we've got 
60 seconds left. Have you got any thoughts, any, anything that's occurred to you sitting by the but fire you, there? You asked about the ambition for the book. My ambition will be forget about India, China, and America, big countries. And may, there are many, many small countries, nearly 190 small countries. If small countries can enact such law in their small countries, then China, India, and America, big countries, will follow the suit. So let the small countries lead the way. Yay! Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I'll drink to that. <laughs> Go and get it. Use this hashtag. Thank you all so much for sitting in. Um, Celine, thank you, Jane Davison, for your contribution to humanity. I will do my part to lift this effort. Let's finish there. Thank you. Congratulations, Jane. Satish, thanks so much for sitting in. Um, great, to, to, great to get both your contributions. And uh, Chelsea Green, good on you for publishing such an important book. Go well, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.